So this is sort of a broad overview of OCD. I think many of us are familiar with this, but just in case you're not, um, that's why I developed this particular uh, talk. This is a talk that I gave uh, to medical students. And I've given it now for three years, but I took some stuff out because I thought um, it's probably not relevant, uh, at least some of it, um, to us. So uh, this is the, the front slide. That's Nicolas Cage in the movie Matchstick Men. He played a con artist with severe OCD. I recommend the uh, movie very much. I think it was I think it was pretty good, although his portrayal of OCD was um, pretty good. Uh, but I think uh, well, I don't know. You can you can tell you can sort of watch the movie and tell me what you think. And this is just uh, an outline of the presentation. Okay, so before we get started, I think it's important to um, identify or define uh, what an obsession is and what a compulsion is, because there seems to be a lot of confusion about these two. Um, so an obsession is a recurrent and intrusive thought, feeling, idea, or sensation. So it's a mental event, and a compulsion is a behavior. So compulsion is a conscious, standardized, recurrent behavior such as counting, checking, or avoiding. And it's important that you, you, you know that a compulsion can be a mental act in the sense that um, if you count or you repeat a word in your, in your, in your head or you um, constantly uh, do some sort of mental gymnastics uh, you know, over and over and over again until sort of it's just right, um, that would be considered a compulsion. You don't physically have to be doing anything, um, you know, like washing your hands, although that's a compulsion. Um, that's, those are not the only types of compulsions. So an obsession is the intrusive thought, um, idea, or feeling that you have. And the compulsion is the actual act um, or behavior that's manifested. We say that in OCD, obsessions and compulsions are ego dystonic. What that really means um, is that there, um, we realize that there's a problem. So some people are just very uh, tidy and very neat, and they feel that in order to be successful, I, they have to have everything in, in line and organized, and it doesn't bother them. Well, in OCD, the obsessions and the compulsions are bothersome. That we realize that this is just ridiculous that we're thinking these things or that we're having those thoughts or that this is just not, this is, you know, stressful, uh, anxiety provoking. And so we say that they're ego dystonic rather than ego syntonic. So for example, um, obsessive compulsive personality disorder is more ego syntonic. In other words, people who have um, very sort of obsessive compulsive traits in their personality um, are not suffering uh, because, the, because their sort of um, obsessive compulsive symptoms are in line with what they believe um, is uh, the way to live your life. So the compulsive acts are carried out in an attempt to relieve the anxiety associated with the obsession but we know that that relief is just never quite enough. And so then we, we kind of continue to do that obsession. I'm sorry, we continue to obsess and have those compulsive behaviors over and over and over again. And we also, we also very much know that resisting a compulsive act increases our anxiety, which is the whole point of doing the compulsive act because it's an attempt to relieve that anxiety that we feel. And by anxiety, I, that's a very general term, but, and it can mean a lot of different things, but I should really say that we're when you resist the compulsive act, it increases the discomfort. So statistics I really don't like, but obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, we know that about two to 3% um, of the general population um, is diagnosed with OCD. It's the fourth most common outpatient psychiatric diagnosis. 10% of outpatients um, in psychiatric clinics carry a diagnosis. And we know from studies um, across cultures that uh, OCD is not specific to any one socioeconomic class, not specific to any one culture, country, 
race, uh, gender, it's, it's um, when we look at the, at the rates, uh, it, very similar across cultures. It's estimated that 40% of patients with OCD do not achieve a clinical response from selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So the SSRIs um, are the Prozacs and the Zolofs and the Paxils, the Luvox, um, the Selexas and the Lexapros, all of those medications um, are first line treatments, medication treatments for OCD. And we know that only about 40%, I'm sorry, we know that, um, that 40%, about 40% don't achieve a response from those medications. So males, I'm sorry, so females um, are slightly more affected um, than males in adulthood. Uh, but interestingly, in childhood, it's the opposite. And why that is, um, it could be that um, it's not true and that um, girls are just not um, identified or picked up during that time. But based on epi epidemiological data, um, boys are two to three times more affected um, based on those statistics than girls. But again, you know, when you're, when you're looking at statistical studies, in psychiatry, you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt. So the mean age of onset is about 19 and a half years old. Rarely do, rarely do we see OCD diagnosed um, after 35, although it does happen. Uh, males um, typically have an earlier age of onset than females, and um, the age of onset for males or boys is about 19 years old, and girls is about 22 years old for the onset of OCD symptoms. And about 60% we know have symptoms uh, prior to 25 years old. And only 15 or less than 15% have symptoms after uh, 35, onset of, symptom, onset of symptoms after 35 years old. So in other words, it's pretty rare. So after 35 years old, if you're just newly developing OCD symptoms, that's when we sort of start thinking maybe there's, there's um, secondary causes of OCD that we should be looking into. Uh, single persons are more affected than married persons possible risk factors. Okay, so genetic factors are, are, are play a huge role. So um, the monozygotic concordance rate is 0.57. What the heck does that mean, right? So monozygotic twins are identical twins. And when they do studies um, with twin studies, what they're asking is if we take these twins and presumably monozygotic twins have identical DNA, if one of those twins has OCD, what is the probability that the other twin has OCD? That's essentially what concordance rate means. So it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but it, that's sort of the best explanation in short that I can give you. So we know that the concordance rate is about 57%, which means that, you know, that the probability that the other twin will have OCD if one of them already has it is about 57%. So what that tells us is that there is a large genetic component um, to OCD. But it's not everything. Because if it was everything, then both it would be 100%. Um, the environmental factors, um, trauma, abuse, infections, uh, psychosocial and developmental factors. Um, there's a lot of controversy about uh, something called PANDAS, which is Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Strep Infections. And then we'll talk about that in a minute. So some associated conditions, 90% uh, of patients with OCD have psychiatric comorbidities. What that means is that 90% of patients who have or have a diagnosis of OCD also have other psychiatric disorders. So 76% have anxiety disorders, 63% have mood disorders, 56% have impulse control disorders, and 39% have substance use disorders. This makes sense. This makes sense to me because when you look at the neurobiology of OCD and what we know about it, and you look at the neurobiology of impulse control disorders and substance use disorders, there's a lot of overlap. Um, and it makes sense to me why there would be um, a high comorbidity 
um, amongst OCD patients. So 30% of patients with OCD have accompanying tick disorder. Um, and again, this goes back to, if you look at the neurobiology, which we will look at soon, um, in OCD, very much overlaps with Tourette's and other tick disorders. About 50% of children with OCD are also diagnosed with ADHD, separation anxiety, uh, specific phobias and anxiety disorders, and like I said before, Tourette's disorder. So um, in the DSM-5, in the United States, we use the, the uh, DSM-5. The DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it's sort of the holy grail, holy bible, if you will, of um, criteria for diagnosing different psychiatric disorders. So in the DSM-5, um, the first criteria is that you must have the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. So you can either have an obsession or compulsions, um, or you can have both of them. So you don't necessarily need to have compulsive behaviors to be diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, and you don't necessarily need to have obsessions um, to be diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. However, if you ask as experts in the field who see OCD on a regular basis, they'll tell you that it's very rare that you find somebody who has one, just one. If you dig deep enough, usually you're able to find uh, that there are both obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are defined by one and two. So the one is recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges or images that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive and unwanted and that cause marked anxiety or distress. The individual attempts to ignore, suppress these thoughts um, or to neutralize them with another thought or action. So in other words, by performing a compulsion. So you need to have, so obsessions are defined according to the DSM-5 by these two um, uh, criteria. Compulsions are defined as repetitive behaviors or mental acts that the individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. So for example, I used to have a, um, when I was first diagnosed, I used to have um, a, an interesting ritual where before I left the room, I had to open the door a certain number of times and say a certain word. That is a very rigid, um, you know, a rule to have to follow. And so that, and that was repetitive, right? And I mean, I was doing this over and over and over again. Um, this, so that, that would be considered a compulsive act. And the behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress. So if I stop, if I didn't do it, or if I tried to avoid it, it was like, oh my gosh, I, I, was, I had to do it. I mean, I just had to. If I didn't, I, I don't know what would happen, but it didn't really matter because I was just like, I have to do this, right? So the behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress. It's like, oh my God, I'd rather just do this than sit there and feel this distress. Or preventing some dreaded event or situation. So some people will have sort of this, what we call magical thinking, where if I don't do this, uh, maybe something will happen to my dog, or maybe something will happen to my family, um, or something completely unrelated. So um, these behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way uh, with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent, and they're clearly excessive. So that's how we define uh, compulsions. And then of course, there's the time component, which uh, they say you need, you know, you have to have at least um, an hour of your day occupied by these uh, obsessions and compulsions, and that must cause uh, distress or impairment in your life. I mean, that's any any disorder. If we're going to call anything a disorder, um, it really has to have some impairment in your life, uh, uh, and uh, the symptoms are not attributable to uh, physiologic effects of a drug, for example. Many of the stimulants, um, for example, uh, methamphetamine, um, cocaine, um, there, there's um, certain medical medications, for example, Abilify um, has been shown to, to have some OCD provoking behaviors. Um, the other one that um, is notorious are the dopamine um, agonists they use for either restless leg syndrome or Parkinson's disease, um, that can cause obsessive compulsive type behaviors and thoughts. The disturbance is not better explained by symptoms of another mental disorder, 
And then we specify whether the insight is good, um, fair, poor, absent, or delusional, and whether there's ticks. Okay, so this is a, um, a diagram. I, I really think that um, OCD is, at its core, a disorder of pathologic doubt. And the doubt is manifested in a number of different ways. Um, contamination, the fear that there's some bacteria or virus or some something you know, that it's contaminated, dirty, um, responsibility, what that means, or what, what I mean by responsibility is you have these intrusive you know, thoughts that are really disturbing. You start attributing it to yourself. You start taking responsibility for those thoughts. Oh my gosh, why am I, if I'm having these thoughts, it must say something horrible about myself or something horrible about me. And if something's horrible about me, then maybe I'm gonna do something to somebody else. And then you start doubting yourself and you start doubting your actions, uh, your feelings. And this is something that if you have OCD, you know how debilitating this can be. Um, so that's the responsibility, uh, doubt, uh, reflection of self. If I don't, if these things aren't the way that they're supposed to be or the way that I need them to be, it's a reflection of myself and it means something about me. Um, and then, so that's, that's a, be another type of doubt. And then the magical thinking is, for example, like I said, um, I think the classic cliche example is uh, if I, uh, if you step on this crack, I'll break my mother's back or something like that. You know, it's, uh, that's sort of the cliche term, uh, phrase, but uh, you can come up with all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's so, like one, I had one a uh, long, long time ago. It was like, if I don't do this, something, it was like this very like weird um, belief, but I just, I had to do that. I, I just had no choice, you know, um, until I started seeking therapy and realizing that I did have a choice uh, in that. And of course, we'll talk about that um, later. So then on the outside there are the, so the, so the doubt is in the center, right? And that's where all the sort of, that's kind of the core. And then on the outside are all the different behaviors um, that are sort of trying to compensate uh, for the doubt. And those behaviors are really these sort of compulsive behaviors that are associated with the different doubts. So when we are doubting contamination or we're fearing contamination, we start washing our hands. Um, if we take responsibility for everything, maybe we're perfectionists. We have everything needs to be exactly the way we need it to be because it's a reflection of ourselves. Um, perhaps uh, we're uh, checking over and over and over and over and over again because we are just maybe I didn't do it but what if I didn't so we're doubting we're just we're constantly checking because we're not quite reassured enough um, and then the nail biting and masturbation hair pulling um, the restricted eating and those are all would be considered all the compulsive type behaviors in response to um, you know the distress associated with intrusive feelings thoughts disturbing disturbing images um, and the like. This is the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. It's what we use um, to monitor symptoms in individuals with OCD. Uh, it's a scale out of 40 and uh, it divides, um, it's divided into two, right? So there's the first five questions are um, the obsessions and then the uh, last five are about the compulsions and you took this on day one. So a little bit about the neurobiology. Um, we will uh, talk about the neurobiology next.